Hi there. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for, for such a nice, engaging lunch together. We're looking forward to getting the afternoon started. Uh, my name is Andrea Parthasarathy, and I'm a career and professional development specialist at UC Berkeley, and I am going to be your moderator for this session this afternoon. Um, and I have the pleasure of welcoming everyone to Purpose and Connection, your keys to career advancement in a hybrid and distributed world, uh, presented by Nicole Resch. Um, and you can access all of the materials for this and all of our sessions on the NOW Conference websites within the description of each session. Um, also, please be aware that this session is being recorded and it's going to be posted on our NOW Conference website and our YouTube channel um, for broader viewing after the conference ends. Um, additionally, if you have a question, please just make sure you raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you. We got a big space and we just want to make sure everyone can hear your question that you're asking. Um, and with that, I'm happy to introduce you to our presenter. Uh, Nicole Resch is a co-founder of Imperative, which is a relationship platform that helps people build meaningful connections at work through high impact uh, conversations. The kind that used to only be possible when we were in person, face to face. Uh, she co-authored Making Work Meaningful, a joint research project with PwC, Imperative, and CECP. And she has been a featured speaker for higher education, Fortune 500, and HR conferences, including the University of Michigan, Microsoft, Santa Fe, PwC, and HR Transform. So let's give a warm welcome to Nicole. Um, and oh, now I hear myself. Uh, so before we kick off, I've been um, floating around talking to folks, and I hear things are going very well. Uh, great content, sessions, food, lunch conversations. So I would love to start by just celebrating the planning committee. Let them know how it's going. All right, so a few years ago, a man attended his alumni, his reunion of his class at Harvard Business School. His name was Clayton. And what he found, as you can imagine, is that this was a group of people that had amassed very impressive life and career achievements. These were rising Fortune 500 stars, they were growing families, they were traveling all over the world, they had very impressive status on Delta. But what he also found, surprisingly, is how many of them were reporting how unhappy they were. So this is a scenario where despite very of titles, despite healthy families, despite exciting lifestyles, you had a group of classmates that kept saying, what's the matter? Why is this not enough? And he actually got very curious about that. In fact, interviewed all of them and ended up writing a very fascinating book. But in one of the interviews, one of his classmates said to him, you know, I did everything right. I followed the path. Why do I feel this way? And it's because, well, some people might say that was a garden variety mid midlife crisis moment, but this is happening at age 30. This is happening at age 25. Um, Edelman has published a survey for the last 20 years, and for the very first time, they found that the number one reason that people are leaving jobs is to find more fulfilling work. Number one reason, fulfillment. People are following the path and it's not getting them where they wanna go. And here's why. The path is flawed. It's leading people to the wrong destination. So what I wanna invite you to do for the next hour is I want to invite you to consider purpose and meaningful connection as the building blocks of your career and I want you to consider fulfillment as the destination. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna introduce you to some of the early research on purpose at work, and then I'm gonna let you roll around in it a little bit. I'm gonna give you a chance to baseline your own fulfillment. I'm gonna introduce you to one of your core purpose drivers, and then we're gonna put it all together with the connection experience here in the room. So let me, let's see, oh, we know who I am. So, um, the biggest study on purpose at work started with an organization called the Taproot Foundation. And Aaron Hurst, the founder of Taproot, 
He observed about 20 years ago that there wasn't a way of connecting people who were professionals, like all of us, who wanted to volunteer with nonprofit organizations who were looking for their skills. So you might have a designer really interested in volunteering their time, and then you might have a nonprofit organization that needs to design a website, but there was no way of putting the two of them together at the mutual moment of need. And so what Aaron did was essentially create what was Tinder for nonprofits. So you go in there as a nonprofit, you list you know, what my project is, what I want to get done, and as a professional, you list this is the thing I'm willing to do, and then they're matched. And so within about 10 years, you had a global footprint of hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who were volunteering with nonprofits, completing projects, and then talking about what the impact was. And some really interesting patterns started to emerge. The first one was he heard over and over again, I find this volunteer work that I'm doing for free so much more fulfilling than my paycheck job. So here you have people who are working four, eight, ten extra hours for free on top of their job to find a level of fulfillment that they're not getting in the 50 hours a week that they're already investing. And so that became something worth looking into. And so we uh, partnered with, this is where actually when I joined Aaron at this point, partnered with PwC, NYU, some other um, private industry, academic institutions to start to dig into why. What is this about? And can we do something about it? And the first thing we found in our first, very first Workforce Purpose Index, we asked, is this something that is unique to Taproot volunteers, or is this a pervasive problem? And we found that two-thirds of the workforce is actually reporting the same thing, that they're unfulfilled. Now, okay, so is that a problem? Some might argue, and many, many, many people did. You know what? It's actually a dramatic overreach to expect that I'm going to get my personal fulfillment from my job. So my job is where I have my basic needs met. I go and I do a good job, I get a salary, I meet my basic needs, I pay my rent, and I get my fulfillment on Saturdays and Sundays. And so we decided to look into that. And what we found is that of all those people who are saying, I'm not very fulfilled at work, only 1% of them were saying, but I'm fulfilled overall in life because I'm getting my fulfillment elsewhere. In other words, these people are not finding their fulfillment on Saturdays and Sundays. So when you put those two things together, two-thirds of the workforce unfulfilled, and the fact that that actually has a ripple effect across their entire life, that felt like a societal problem that was worth us solving. We envisioned a world where companies exist as much to provide goods and services to the customer as they do to provide fulfilling work for the employee. And then our mission was born. So our mission, we are very focused on empowering every employee to make their work fulfilling. So the first place we looked was purpose. We figured if we're going to look at fulfillment, purpose probably plays a role. What, what, are, what are folks' purpose drivers? And we ended up coming across a lot of myths. So the first myth, myth is that purpose is a luxury. There was actually a very famous course, I think it was at Harvard, called Learn, Earn, Return, which is this whole uh, arc of life that you go to school, then you go work and you make a whole bunch of money and you don't, don't think about your fulfillment or your purpose or anything. But then when you retire, then you can start to think about, well, what gives me that sense of purpose and fulfillment? And the problem with that is that then you would expect to find a disproportionate number of people in a certain socioeconomic bracket that are reporting being fulfilled and having a sense of individual purpose. And that is not true. The next myth we found is that, well, purpose is a cause. So if only I could leave my job in insurance um, and, and go and work for um, something that is, is, is something that's much closer to my heart, then I would get a sense of purpose. And I have a friend who did this. He put it very, very well. He said, I left finance, I joined an advocacy organization, and I found the exact same issues. I'm just getting paid a lot less. So that's a myth. The other thing we heard, oopsie daisy, I jumped ahead. Can I go back? Nope, that's okay. Um, the other myth we heard is that only some purpose I'm sorry, only some jobs have purpose. And the University of Michigan did a fascinating study about this. They studied a position in hospitals, um, orderlies. There might be other names for this position, but it's essentially folks who are in an operating room, for example, cleaning up sort of everything that's left behind. And they focused on this population because in addition to being very, very difficult work, 
This is also a job that is very seldom acknowledged. So these are people doing this work and also people don't even acknowledge they're there. So we thought, okay, let's look at this particular population and maybe we can prove that there's no way these people can feel a sense of purpose. And what they found is that those folks were as likely as anybody else to report feeling that their jobs gave them purpose. And finally, there is this whole notion of the revelation. So I'm gonna to go to that $3,500 yoga retreat, or I'm gonna climb Mount Everest, or I'm gonna to go to graduate school, and suddenly I'm gonna be hit with my purpose and everything's gonna be okay. The problem with that is that it assumes that purpose is something that sort of hits you, that's done to you, when actually it's a muscle that you have to exercise. So, if it's not on the top of a mountain, if it's not in my bank, where is it? How can I find this, this, this holy grail? So in order to answer that question, we went back to that initial survey of fulfillment. And we thought, well, what, what if we were to look at what's unique about the folks that are fulfilled at work? What do they say? And overwhelmingly, they had three things in common. The first thing was that they reported that they had meaningful relationships at work. So this is not that they had a whole bunch of networks and you know they could say, hey, Bob, you know, a lot of people to talk to. This was, they reported that they had a network, you know, modest, of people with whom they had vulnerable, open, consistent, and positive interactions. Talked about careers, solved problems. So that was the first thing. They all said that. The second thing they all said is that they were making an impact that was meaningful to them and that was outside of themselves. They were impacting a person, a group, a mission, a project, but it wasn't necessarily something about their title, their salary, what they did, it was their impact on something outside of themselves and it gave them tremendous meaning. The third thing they said was that they were always consistently supported to step outside of their comfort zone and try things that maybe were new and that they weren't yet good at and that might even lead to failure. And they said that by doing that consistently, they were growing. So to summarize, Relationships, impact, and growth. And we call that RIG. It's an acronym, and you're gonna hear me say that now several times throughout the rest of the conversation. And the way we use that is, uh, we use that uh, in our annual Workforce Purpose Index to baseline societal fulfillment every year, and Fortune 500 companies have been using that to evaluate and baseline the efficacy of their employee experience programs. So. I want to give you all a chance to trial this. Okay, so take out a piece of paper. I think, they've, I think we've provided paper in the middle of the room, and I'm gonna ask you all a series of three questions. This is a five-point Likert scale. So one is, you just don't even agree whatsoever. Five is, yes, 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 strongly agree. So on a scale of one to five, how much do you agree with, I have relationships that are meaningful? So to put a little bit more tissue or meat on this, on one end of the spectrum, if you left tomorrow, would anybody notice? If the answer is no, that's, that's what a one looks like. On the other end of the spectrum, there is not a day that goes by that you don't have consistent interaction with folks who are listening non-judgmentally, you can be vulnerable, you can be open, they're helping you solve problems. So one to five. And I need a signal when folks are done. Maybe raise a hand, put your hand on your nose. I got a hand. All right, all right. I feel like we're good. So R, that's your R score. Let's look at impact. Do you agree? I am making an impact that matters to me. So on one end of the spectrum, you might say, gosh, you know, I'm killing it at work, but honestly, I'm not doing anything that I actually care about. That's what a one looks like. On the other end of the spectrum, um, you can't wait to get home every night and talk about the impact you made at work today. So one to five on your I. Oh, thank you, someone's catching on, yes, awesome. All right, now we're ready for the, for the G. So, G, I have regular opportunities for growth through new skills and experiences. So, at a one, you might think back and really search and ask yourself, what have I learned new in the last year? If the answer is really nothing, that's a one. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're working on a team or with a manager who is constantly inviting you to think about drifting into new skills and experiences and you are fully supported to fail, that's what a five looks like. All right, got hands, got hands. All right, so at this point, you should have an R and a number, an I and a number, 
and a G in a number, and we are going to come back to that. The goal, what we're looking for in work, is a four or a five across all three dimensions. Not one, not two, but all three. And here is how companies are using this. One is in career development conversations. So think about those moments where it's the end of the day and you reach a point and it's like, look, I gotta make a change. So it's, it's about trying to figure out what your next career move is. On the, other, on the other hand, you're probably approached often by either direct reports or colleagues who are coming to you for guidance. It's very hard to know where to start with those conversations. So think about rig, the rig framework as a scaffolding for that conversation, either for yourself or for an individual. And you can use it in two different ways. One way is it can help you diagnose what the problem is. What is the press to make a change? Is it necessary? One of the things we hear over and over and over coming out of these conversations is people say to us, you know, I actually thought, I went into this thinking I had to leave. And what I didn't realize is I really just had to figure out what the issue was, and I was able to fix it right here where I am. Now sometimes that isn't gonna be the case. Sometimes you go through this and you realize, gosh, there's a dead end across all three of these. I'm not going to be able to fix this. And so the second thing this can do is it can give you a roadmap beyond title, beyond salary, beyond job duties for your next role. So hang on to that score, we are gonna come back to it. What I wanna do now is answer the next question, which is okay, great. So maybe you got, maybe you gave yourself a two in impact. Maybe you gave yourself a one in growth. What do you do with that information? Well, what kinds of impact would be better? What would make me feel better? What would be more meaningful for me? Sometimes we don't even know where to start. What kinds of growth opportunities? My manager is supported, but I don't even know what kind of roadmap to give her. <coughs> Excuse me. That's where purpose drivers come in. And the thing with purpose is that it's very, very difficult to talk about. It's very difficult to pin down. It's sort of a, po there's poetry, there's art. It's one of those things that was popularized in the Supreme Court in 1964 where I know what it looks like, see it, but I don't actually know how to describe it. So there again, we went back to folks, we went back to the taproot sample, and we wanted to understand, well, what are these people who are talking about feeling that sense of purpose? What are they talking about? And actually, a pattern emerged. They talked about three things. The first thing is they talked about the way they were having an impact. And we talk about three different elevations of impact, and I'll, I'll I'll sh I'm going to invite you into that in just a second. So when we talked to the Taproot folks, they kept telling us over and over that there was, it wasn't just about the fact that they were making an impact, but we said, what kind of impact? They talked about impact at one or another specific elevation. The second thing is that it was about the values that were driving their work. And there was this very profound alignment. There was a values alignment with what they were doing at work. And finally, they talk about how they got to actually perform their work. So what I want to do with you right now is I want to introduce you, I want to click down into one of those purpose drivers, the element of impact. So this is what determines the level at which you find the greatest purpose at work. And there are three levels. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through this using the metaphor of healthcare. And I want you to think through, as I'm talking, which one of these resonates most with you? Because that's gonna provide you with some direction, okay? The first one we talk about is individual impact. So let's think about this hospital situation. Imagine a doctor, right? This is a doctor who has what we call an individual impact driver. So he's got a patient comes in, Ying. Ying has sprained her elbow, and she's got a lacrosse championship coming up. And this doctor is gonna run home and is gonna to talk to his family about, okay, I, she came in, we were able to set it, she brought her lacrosse stick in, I figured, I figured out how to let her cradle and score. By the way, does anyone else play lacrosse? Or is, <laughs> any lacrosse, any laps? No? Okay. Well, in lacrosse, you cradle. There's an elbow situation. So this doctor is talking to his family about how he was able to work with this woman. He's talking in terms of the real person with the real story that he had an impact on that day. That is a hallmark of folks with an individual driver. So let's look at what it looks like when somebody's got an org driver. It is not that this person's not equally invested in Ying and her lacrosse championship. We're all human beings, right? But these folks are fixated 
on ensuring that everybody that walks through the hospital door has the same experience. They talk about systems, consistency, building processes, uh, efficiencies. I hired someone once to do an account management role, and in her 30-day check-in, I was very interested to talk about her relationship with the program manager at Hasbro, et cetera. And all she could focus on was, what can we do internally to scale our internal organization? And that was, she talked about scale, efficiency, that's hallmark language for someone with an org driver. And then you've got folks with a society driver. So these are people, yet again, very happy to hear about Ying and her lacrosse championship and her sprain and, and how that was addressed obviously invested in the efficiency of the hospital overall, but this person cannot go to bed at night until they know that everybody in this room, in the city, in the country has access to that healthcare to begin with. So these people will work for years on even the tiniest policy toward that end and feel tremendous about it. I wish I had this insight 20 years ago. I happened to have a society driver, and I was working in Uganda for an organization that was setting up sports programs in refugee camps all over the country. And I had two roommates that would spend their days uh, training coach, hiring and training coaches in all of our 19 different programs. And I was trying to figure out how can we get access to certain parts of the country where there's a civil war, because there is tremendous need in the IDP camps up there. And so one day I came home and I said, hey guys, we did it. UNICEF has agreed to let us use their convoy and give us a $75,000 grant if we will go up and set up sports programs in the IDP camps up in the north. And I thought, you know, there's going to be celebration. And I'll tell you the level of contempt that I got from these two women was something that I will not forget. They looked at me and they said, so you mean to tell me that we have just spent the last three months actually impacting people's lives? and you've been having meetings so we can get access to cars? Now, obviously both are important, but what we didn't have was the language to understand that yes, for them, impact is at an individual level. If you can't tell me the story of the person whose life I just changed, then I'm not interested. And for me, I was all about, we need to give greater access to everything that we're doing. We need more coaches, we need to access more programs. So a lot of this is about getting a language that we haven't had before. All right, so I want to shift for a second from the role of purpose drivers, but what I, before that, I want you to reflect for just a moment on what I just said. You talk about the individual driver, the org driver, and the societal driver. We're going to come back to this. On a gut level, on your rig, she on that same piece of paper, I, I want you to just take a stab at which one of those impact elevations resonated most with you. And as we get into our conversations, we're going to come back to that. Y'all done? You guys got it? Good enough? Okay. So I now want to shift. We talked about the role of individual purpose. I want to shift into the role that connection plays in all of this. You all know probably, that individual insight is powerful. But until you activate that, it doesn't really go beyond edutainment, right? Something has to happen with that. There's an author, a really, really interesting woman, Margaret J. Wheatley. She decided to take quantum physics and apply the theories of quantum physics to leadership development and organizational development. And what she said was, look it, the most exciting things only happen when two things collide, whether you're talking about subatomic particles or whether you're talking about two people. And we have found the very same thing when it comes to taking all of this insight about your baseline fulfillment, about your purpose drivers, and actually activating it and hacking it. And remember, I'm gonna keep it, I'm gonna, I wanna make a very important point here. Diagnosing your purpose, uncovering your purpose drivers is not about, oh, I am X and so therefore I should do Y job. It's actually about understanding where do I find meeting so that I can then hack the job I'm already in to activate that particular driver? But you can't do that alone. And you would think that uh, given our history 
as human beings, that this would come very naturally to us. We've always used connection to survive. It's how we've learned and adapted. It's how we've solved problems. But what we found is that almost half of us have a very, very difficult time doing this. And this was a bit of an alarm bell for us. And in fact, we've devoted our entire 2022 Workforce Purpose Index to trying to figure out how to solve this problem. Because if our goal is to try and empower everybody to make work fulfilling, but we can't get people to talk to one another, that's a blocker. So we wanted to understand, well, what, what's going on for folks? And we, it came down to a couple of different things. The first thing it came to is, look at the environment, especially now, doesn't support connection. And people don't know where to begin. So at the end of the day, really work is sort of a, a sixth grade dance situation. You got, you know, all these nervous kids lined up all around the wall of the gym, afraid to get in the middle of the dance floor. And yet, what we found is everyone actually wants to connect. So we know it's, it's we know it's on the, it's the path to fulfillment. We know we all want it, but it's not happening. And so that's what we're going to start doing here in just a moment. By the way, um, one point, this is not a COVID thing. Um, uh, there were a lot of studies that were happening well before the pandemic that pointed out that actually we were suffering from isolation issues. Um, I think this one is from 2019. So this is not, this is not new. This is not pandemic related. This is actually a, a societal problem. And so what I want to do now with all of that in mind is I want to put all of us into connection. So the first thing we're going to, we're going to spend, let's see, I got to look at what, what our time is here. Uh, okay, this is perfect. So we'll probably take about 20 minutes for this act activity. The first thing is I would guess that most of you are sitting with people that you already know. So I'm going to challenge you to look around the room and maybe move to a spot where there is somebody that you don't know. So I'm going to pause and allow that moment to happen for just a second. You all, you all don't know each other? Oh, okay, there you go. All right, I'm sensing we've settled in. Everyone found a spot? Now this exercise is going to be done in pairs. So now you might look around and find, oh dear, I'm at a table with an odd number. Raise your hand if you don't have a partner yet. Okay, we've got someone over here. We've got someone here. All right, so maybe you, and actually, no, you have more room at your table. Would the, are you covered? You got it? Okay, one other partner. And Andrea, if we have an odd number, maybe you? Yeah, okay, there you go. All right, everyone's sorted. All right, so here's how this is gonna work. I am gonna supply the questions. So that's a huge relief, right? So this is about, if you think back to RIG, <coughs> and think back to what people are talking about when they're reporting fulfillment. They're talking about relationships that are meaningful. They're based on trust. And there's a very specific way we're gonna go about this, and it comes from a study that actually came out of one of your schools. It came out of the UC system. There was a researcher named Arthur Aronson, and his research question was, how can we take two strangers and establish trust within 45 minutes? And there were two answers to the question. One was, the question matters. And I'm gonna, we're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share that question with you, those questions with you. The second was that it has to be based on a model of reciprocity and response. So if Andrew and I are in a conversation, and I keep asking her questions, and she gives these really substantive answers, and then I have a follow-up, and she's answering me, and she's getting all this insight, that's great. But that's executive coaching or therapy. This is about forming trust. And so to do that, we're going to apply a model of reciprocity and response. 
So when I ask Andrea a question, I'm then going to stop talking and let her fully answer, and I'm going to probe for more. But we're not going to move on to the next question until I have a, an opportunity to answer as well. What that does is it enables us to take equal steps forward, equal levels of self-disclosure, and that is how you form trust. Okay? So we're going to take, we, I got three questions, and we'll take about um, maybe two or three minutes each per question. I have been trying to figure out how to do this in a way that is not completely obnoxious. I think I'm just going to say switch. That's, probably, that's the best thing I came up with. So here's your first question. I want you to ask your partner to think back. What is their earliest memory of being inspired by a career? And describe, have them describe for you why it felt inspiring to them at that time. And the first, for your first partner, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to let you know when it's time to switch. And then after that, we're going to go to the next question. So with that, I am going to say, go. <laughs> invite you now to switch. And we have a new question. So feel free to wrap up the response to the last one. And now you're going to ask your partner, Knowing who and where you are today, what makes you proud of the career that you've paved for yourself, and what has surprised you? So first partner, five minutes, and then we'll switch again. All right, some of you may have noticed we've got our third and final question up, and it's really centered on inspiration. So I want to invite you, if you've if you have already f completed the last one, both partners, <clears throat> I want to invite you to ask your partner, where have you noticed, <clears throat> excuse me, yourself feeling inspired this year? And I really want you to encourage them to describe a specific example. That's, that's where the magic is. So describe an example of, ask them to describe an example of when they have felt inspired. And this is our final question. So we'll do five minutes each side and then I'm gonna pull you all back together and we're gonna talk about what you can actually do once you leave this room. Okay, five minutes. All right, I'm gonna invite all of you to wrap up your final conversation. <clears throat> Delightful. So a couple questions. How many of you made a new connection? Raise your hand. All right, that's the right answer. What else are you going to say? Uh, <laughs> how many of you would be willing to connect again, either with your partner or with somebody else in the room, for a similar conversation in the next two weeks? Raise your hand. All right, look around. This is the myth at work, ladies and gentlemen. We're all sitting around on the wall, waiting to get on the dance floor. So we're going to come back to that little tidbit. So there's a reason that we do this. This is a recipe that we have been leveraging with companies. And it's because um, when you put two people together with the right question and a model of reciprocity and response, it goes back to that quantum physics thing, exciting things happen. I was telling Andrea in the break, this research was actually popularized in a New York Times article that some of you all might have remembered. Did anyone read How to Fall in Love in 36 Questions? Yeah, okay, um, maybe you didn't read it. That's not what we're going for, even you know, despite the mentions of Tinder before. But the, the premise is the same. It's, it's two people, you get into, Andrew was talking about this a little bit earlier, you get beyond the surface level very quickly, and everything's okay, and you emerge with a new connection where you can be open, vulnerable, consistent, and these are the kinds of relationships that contribute to your journey on fulfillment. Now, here's something that comes up a lot. People come and say, well, God, this is so great in a conference, and I loved this, and it was a huge highlight, but I'm going to go back, and nobody's doing Like, I can't make space for this in my day. I've got a caseload of 900 students and everything else. And so I want to share with you a couple of the things that we're doing with the hope of reinforcing that actually this is starting to happen. So one of the companies that we work with is Target. And Target decided that they actually wanted to create, actively create a pathway 
for their employees to authentically, net, authentically connect with their own purpose and with the purpose of the organization. And we've got people coming and saying, you know, this is actually kind of a surprising experience. And this is, actually, this is a valuable part of my career development conversation. And that's happening at a scale of thousands. This is one single organization that we all know very well. Um, we're also working with Microsoft. Microsoft has decided that as they are developing senior leaders, there again, they want to create a pathway for their emerging leaders to discover and activate their own moment so that they can then do that for others. And we're hearing very similar comments to this one, which is kind of new, and it's actually really cool. It's pretty valuable. The point I'm making here is that this is starting to make its way into the mainstream and outside of the conference halls. So this last organization I want to highlight is one that you're all familiar with. <laughs> so right here in the UC system, and Andrea's part of this, as, as, is, as is her whole team, there are folks who are doing purpose discovery and then connecting across campuses for these kinds of guided conversations that you all have just had right here. So my point is that the movement to put fulfillment at the center of the career development conversation is happening, and it's happening right here on this campus. You all are part of the innovation. So now the key question is, how do we take this out of the room and back into your offices? So there's a couple of very concrete things I want to recommend. The first one is you all wrote down your rig. I want you to go back to that and understand what's behind that. So you might have had a three in relationships or a two in growth. Understand, well, why? What is it about that? Where is that showing up? That's very, very simple exercise. Share it with a colleague. If you're a manager, share it with a direct report. And even better yet, your manager will love you for this. Bring it to your manager and, and say, hey, this is a framework that I would love to use in our next conversation. I want to talk about my relationship, my impact, and growth. And actually, I want, to do, I want to focus on the growth area. So that's number one. Number two is I gave you a very light introduction to the purpose drivers, but we've actually developed an assessment. It's 27 questions, takes about 10 minutes. And it's a wealth of information that, again, it provides a starting point and some language to start to understand what are my drivers of fulfillment so that I can therefore start to hack my fulfillment at work? Um, this is something we've actually made available. So for, uh, I think we've got for, tw for a window of 24 hours, anyone who's attended this conference can get a license to this. Here's what you gotta do. Pull out your phone. I would never say this in a presentation, but we're at the very end. Pull out your phone, send an email, or write this address down. Just send a note to purpose at imperative.com and you don't even have to put anything in the message. And if it's an at, you know, Berkeley or Merced or Irvine, we will know, we'll, our support team will just send you a license, you'll click it and you'll be able to complete the purpose assessment. You'll get all of the insights. Again, it's designed to help you start the conversation and to give you language for starting on your own purpose and fulfillment journey. And the last thing is courageously connect. Nothing happened that was bad in the room just now. But that's hard, right, to just jump on a cliff and say, hey, Bob, I'd love to connect. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to suggest a very specific agenda. Remember a moment ago when every single person in this room, I think, raised their hand and said, I would be willing to connect with somebody. What you could do is exchange information with somebody, maybe your partner, and set a time to connect again in two weeks. And in that conversation, bring your purpose assessment or bring your, your rig baseline, your fulfillment baseline, and use that as the start of the conversation. That is how you take charge of your own fulfillment and you put fulfillment at the center of your career conversation. Again, this is empowering every employee to own their fulfillment. And I'm inviting you all to join the movement. So thank you very much. And I think do we have time? It looks like we've got a five minutes. Okay, so it looks like we have a few minutes for questions. Any, any, any questions come up for any folks? Andrea's got a mic. In facilitation school, they always teach you to count slowly to nine.
I really, oh. I really liked hearing about um, everyone's inspiring stories, especially my new friend Julian. Um, I'm hoping to hear maybe one or two other inspiring stories that made them um, inspired this year. So raise your hand or I'll, That is a lovely invitation. Is anyone willing to share their partner's inspiring story with permission or their own inspiring story? I know there was a lot of inspiration going on here. Here we go. There we go. The, ch the in invitation lady's my wife, so I'm helping out. <laughs> um, and the other reason I'm helping out is that my partners and my story was very similar. We identified very strongly together, I think, and that's that part of what's uh, making us inspired is being able to build uh, our lives and homes with our partners and the process that that's going through. That's my wife, once again. My partner just got engaged. <laughs> and so that's not necessarily in the context of work, but it's definitely, uh, you know, a part of uh, bringing ourselves and our full selves to work is building our lives together with our partners and being able to do that together. So that's our story. Thank you. Congratulations. Anybody else want to share their own or their partner's inspiring story? It would be a magnificent note to end on. I see, I see a tentative hand over here. You going to commit? Better hurry before I change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say one thank you so much um, for your presentation. It, I really needed it. And what was so amazing is this young lady, Catherine, we not only um, work for, the, for UCOP, but we're on the same floor, um, and we're not too far from each other, and we have this, such a similarity that it's scary. You know, listening to her, I was like, I don't know her, why is she telling my story? <laughs> but this is, this is really, really good, and for us to be able to share with our other coworkers, you know, um, this experience, and. I hope you all have one next year because I'll be here. <laughs> well, thank you all for your willingness to lean in courageously to connection and self-disclosure. And again, I am. this is an invitation to join the movement to put fulfillment at the center of your career. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and thanks again.